One Dallas Seminary professor was in a debate. I listened to him. Someone gave the hypothetical situation. I'm a homosexual. I don't know Jesus as Savior, but I want to go to heaven. And I come to you and I say, how can I get to heaven? His answer, and I quote, turn from your homosexuality and believe in Jesus Christ and you can be saved. I want to suggest to you that repentance means more than a change of mind, but less than an external, physical, or mental, actual turning away from sin. I want to agree with all of you who say that repentance means to change your mind, but I want to narrow it and expand it. I want to say that the big sphere is to change your mind, but within that sphere, it's more specific. I'm to change my mind with regard to my sin to change my mind with regard to my sin. And this particular repentance that we're going to look at, I think, will fit all the meanings in the New Testament. I'm not going to dwell on Shuv from the Old Testament or Necham. I'll deal with that briefly next week, but I want to talk a minute about the root meaning. Both John Calvin and Luther went back to the root meaning themselves to get out of the penance view of repentance. They went back and talked about meta and noeo, and they said it meant to change the mind. Of course, studying the root, that's pretty close to what it is. Meta doesn't mean change, although noeo does mean mind. Meta means after. And so it was as used through the centuries in secular Greek. It meant to look at something after you've already made up your mind about it. And in a hindsight view, you see it in a new way. And so it came to mean to change the mind. But, but never in a religious context. Even in secular Greek, metanoeo does not mean change the mind in a religious context. If you'll read Bame's article and Bert Vine's article in the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, they'll explain to you that in a religious context, they think it means remorse. If you read Zane Hodge's chapter in Absolutely Free, he will say it means remorse. It's a little more than to change the mind, a little bit more. And I agree with Bob that we are uh, using the root fallacy when we try to plug change the mind into the passages of the New Testament. For example, both John and Jesus said this, repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. Now let's plug change the mind in there. Change your mind because the kingdom of God is at hand. Change your mind because the kingdom of God is at hand. You're looking at me sort of nonplussed. Because you don't know what I mean. What do you mean you don't know what I mean? I said change your mind because the kingdom of God is at hand. You might say, well, about what? I don't think that says enough. I think it takes some of the punch out of the meaning of the word. The concept of get right with God would make a whole lot more sense. If I came up to you and I said, get right with God, you might say, why? And I would say, because the kingdom of God is at hand. Get right with God because the kingdom of God is at hand. Revelation 9, I think, is a great example of this. It says there, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or thefts. And so God wiped them out. Does that make any sense, to say it means change of mind there? God wiped these people out because they did not change their mind about their murders, their sorceries, and their sexual immorality, or their thefts? I don't think so. As a matter of fact, if you went to one text where an actual physical turning from sin could be plugged in and made sense for repentance, it would be here. And that's why Bruce Demarest of Denver Seminary claims, and I quote, Repentance is a change of mind, but it is ultimate loyalty and behavior whereby pre-Christians turn from sin on to God. Now, the reason they come to this is invariably they want to work epistrepho into the meaning of repentance. They want to get shooed from the Old Testament into repentance somehow because metanoeo is never the translation in the Septuagint for shooed. But I'm going to suggest to you of the 39 occurrences of epistrepho in the New Testament, all but five of these can easily be shown to be externally observable, a turning that is externally observable. Go with me to James chapter 5 and verse 19 and 20 as a good example of this. And by the way, as you're turning, if you think a believer is not a believer in James 5, read my footnote in this paper. And if you think anyone, which is tis in the Greek New Testament, is not a believer within the congregation of believers, read my footnote, which I don't have time to go into here. However, for those of you who realize that a believer is a believer, 
excuse me, that a brother is a brother, then I think everything falls out. James chapter 5 and verse 20 says this, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, brethren, and if you want to look at this, look at chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. He's talking to believers in Christ who've been born again. Brethren, if any one of you brothers, if any of you wanders from the truth and someone epistrephos him back, let him know that he who epistrephos a sinner from the error of his way will save a life from death and cover a multitude of sins. That's externally observable. The church can see that this brother has strayed from the truth. Someone comes along and turns him back around, and the whole church can observe it. They can see it. It's clear. Of the five uses where epistrepho might mean something internal, I would challenge even those. Matthew 13, Mark 4, John 12, Acts 28, 2 Corinthians 3. They're all going back to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And if you go back to Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10, you'll find a chiastic arrangement. A chiasm is A, B, C, C prime, B prime, A prime. Listen to it. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes. A, B, C. Now listen to C prime, B prime, A prime. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart. They've taken the message and they have internalized it. They've gone full circle. They've gone around the horn. And then what happens? if they heard it correctly. Then it would say, listen to this, and return and be healed. I believe if the shuv in that passage, if the turning in that passage is an internal turning, it would have been within the chiasm. It's not. It does not go A, B, C, D, D prime, C prime, B prime, A prime. It goes A, B, C, C prime, B prime, A prime, and then it says turn and be healed. I believe turning in the New Testament especially, is external. It's something that we can see from outside. So when the above analysis, whether the above analysis of Isaiah 6 bears any weight or not, the vast majority of the uses of epistrophe in the New Testament certainly deal with something externally observable. We conclude, therefore, that turning from one's sin in an observable manner well may be the fruit of repentance or believing, but not part of of the root. What's my definition? May I suggest this to you? Repentance is this. It's an internal resolve to turn from one's sin. Or if I were to quote another famous speaker, Bob Wilkin, it's a decision to turn from one's sin. We agree in our conclusion. So what I want to say is this. Repentance is not a condition for receiving eternal life, but it is a condition for possessing eternal life. There's a difference between going into the kingdom and possessing the kingdom. There's a difference between receiving the free gift of eternal life and possessing eternal life. Someone might say, well, how could Jesus eat with those tax collectors and sinners? How could he have fellowship with them? How could he have table fellowship with obviously sinful men? I might close with this illustration. As a pastor, every week, back when I get home from this conference, I'll be playing racquetball with a man who's moved out of his home. Uh, He has been in BSF for six years. He's taught Sunday school for four years, but he's in a midlife crisis. He's left home. He's been living with another woman. And I'm going to go play racquetball with him. And I meet with him once a week, along with three or four other guys in the same boat. And I have fellowship with them. And they are in sin. But doesn't 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11, say not to fellowship with a so-called believer, claims to be a believer, and yet he's living in gross moral sin? How can we harmonize that? Simply this way. Simply this way. The brother I'm going to play racquetball with has repented. Well, then why is he still hung up in his sin? Because repentance is not an external turning from sin. Repentance is an inner resolve to turn from one's sin, and he has repented. He knows what he's doing is wrong. He wants deliverance from what is wrong, and he's meeting with me to get out of his trap.